Hi guys and welcome on to this video series on mastering with Native Instruments plugins. So my name is Larry Holcomb aka Get To Know and I'm here to deliver this video series for Groove 3. So in this video series we're going to be looking at approaching the mastering process using Native Instruments plugins. Now the Native Instruments suite doesn't include a kind of mastering dedicated collection of plugins but we have some plugins that can be really nicely integrated into your mastering chain. So we don't have a dedicated limiter or multiband compressor but that's not going to let us be prevented from actually integrating these plugins into creating masters. Now, I'm going to be using some different tracks during the video series. One of my own tracks, which we're going to use in this video as our first example. We're going to have a rock track and also a kind of pop, kind of trap style track as well. Now, in this first video, we're going to have a look at using subtractive EQ and filtering and also a little bit of balancing EQ as the first stage of the process. So we're going to try and kind of balance out the track a little bit. Now this is one of my own tracks I'm actually working on at the moment and this is kind of just my production mix so I haven't really actually mixed this track but it's quite good because it, it lends itself to being improved in the mastering process. I'll give you a quick blast, it's kind of a disco-y house kind of track. So you get the idea, it's kind of a groovy disco house kind of track. So the first thing we're going to do is, as I said, look at some EQ examples for this track. So I made a little folder here and I've added in the passive EQ. And this is the EQ we're going to use on this track in the first demonstration. Now the passive EQ is based on a manly massive passive, which is a hardware EQ. And it's really, really perfect for mastering as is the very comp compressor that we're going to look at later, which is based on a manly very mu compressor. I think it's probably my favorite compressor I've ever used. And although I've never actually tried a massive passive hardware unit, I really like the EQ as well. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is create a little bit of filtering on the low and the high end of the track. So a high pass and a low pass filter. Now, why are we going to do this? Well, actually, low frequencies take up a lot of energy in the mix. They need to be very, very loud for us to perceive them and hear them at the same volume as the mid-range and the higher frequencies. Now that means that kind of rumbly low frequencies that are possibly even below our hearing range, because as we get older, our hearing actually prevents us from hearing frequencies that are really, really low. We only go down to 20 hertz, but that's when we're blessed with perfect hearing. So even as we get older, that 20 hertz may be increasing. So it's a good idea to actually try and roll off those very, very low end frequencies that A, take up a lot of energy and B, can't necessarily actually be heard. So you can see there are preset frequencies that you can work at here, the lowest being 22. So let's work at 22 to start with. Now you'll see we have links switched on here, which means we're gonna be working on the same settings for the left and the right hand channel, which is generally what you're gonna to wanna to do unless there is a problem that needs fixing. We're actually gonna look at that a little bit later on. So we're gonna, place this, as I said, on 22, which is going to roll off some of the low frequencies present in the track. Now, it's a good idea. Let's just check that we're in time here and we can loop the track. I believe the tempo is 120. Okay, perfect. So, as I said, it's a good idea to actually work on a kind of busy portion of the track. And let's bring this in and out. Now, it's very, very subtle. I wouldn't say it's night and day different, but to me, there's just a feeling that it's a slightly tighter sounding track when we bring that effect in. It almost creates kind of a ripple effect. 
So when we bring in that low end filtering, suddenly all the frequencies higher up just feel that extra tiny bit clearer. And you often do find that with filtering. Now, as I said, it's subtle, but all these little subtle things add up to a great sounding mix. Now let's try the same on the high frequencies. Now this is, I'd say, less of an issue or less of a kind of audible effect, but let's try rolling off some of the very high frequencies again, going up to 20K. We're not necessarily going to hear that, even though that is the extent of the high frequency range of our hearing, because as we get older, that is going to be reduced as well. So rolling off things above 18K can also be a good idea. It actually almost feels brighter when that's brought in. So maybe having that kind of roll off of the very, very high frequencies allowing some of the frequencies a little bit lower to come through, which we can actually hear. So yeah, I think that's working quite nicely just as a basic filtering approach for the track. Okay, so let's move this on and have a look at working on a little bit of kind of the balance of the track. Now to me, it sounds like it's quite subby, maybe a little bit lacking in the low mids around the kind of 200 area and maybe could be a little bit better represented in the 2 to 3K range as well. So let's have a look at trying to remedy that. Now, some different things we can do here. The four low, low, mid, high, mid, and high frequency bands here can either be boost or cut, depending on which of these buttons is pressed in or which of these kind of colored buttons is pressed in. So you can see it's boost at the moment, but we can change it to cut. And we can also change it to either a bell or a kind of shelf shape as well. So we'll leave that as it is there. Now what I could try doing here is actually maybe set this one as a bell. And from there, we can actually choose to have it very broad or more narrow. And let's create a little dip, be around that kind of subby area, nothing too major. And then let's create a little boost a little bit higher up. So I actually need to set that to cut. Boost higher up. And then let's set a boost in around the 3k range as well and let's see what that gives us So what we're looking to achieve within the mastering process is to create a track which is kind of bigger sounding, wider sounding, taller sounding, with more depth to it as well. So you can hear when I take this effect out, it seems a little bit bloated sounding and a little bit smaller sounding. Like it doesn't occupy as big a space. When I bring it in, it feels like it occupies a greater kind of space. feels somehow kind of stretched. Now this is actually pushing these low, low, mid and high bands higher than I would do ordinarily. Now this is actually, as I said, my production mix, which means that all I've done is dial the sounds into the point where I can actually use them within the production. There's really no dedicated mixing going on, no kind of dedicated compression so much. So actually this is pushing the mastering EQ probably more than I would do ordinarily because some of this I would have worked on a little bit more in the mix. But as I said, it's quite useful to use a track like this in the video series because it allows me to actually show off some of these techniques. And what is also important to note here is that I'm using an analog modeled EQ, a dedicated kind of mastering analog EQ. And I think if I was to repeat the same kind of moves on an EQ that was just like a bog standard DAW digital EQ, I think it would sound very, very thin and, and it would sound over-processed, but I think these kind of EQs, these analog EQs are a lot more forgiving to quite intense processing. So let's give it another blast.
Now, I'm happy we're, we're kind of bringing the track through to the next stage now with a little bit more of a balanced frequency spectrum to it. It's possibly a little bit overcooked, but let's just try it dial back a little bit. It definitely, to me, feels a little bit more alive than it does without the processing in. Okay, so that is the first stage of the mastering process and how we can use the passive EQ for native instruments based on a mentally massive passive to allow us to filter out the low and high frequencies, creating that ripple effect upwards and downwards, meaning the frequencies in between are kind of clearer and better represented. And also using the four bands here, remember there's one for the left side, one for the right, but we're linking them together here to enable us to rebalance the frequency spectrum. And that's what we've achieved in this video. Now, later on in the video series, when we use these plugins to create a mastering chain for the example tracks, we'll come back and maybe try some EQing using one of the other Native Instruments EQ tools that we have available. But I'll leave it there for now. In the next video, we're going to have a look at fixing some problems between the left and the right-hand channel, and also enhancing the mid-side aspects of a mix, again, using passive EQ. So I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching.